to computer. Uh, okay. Um, great. Uh, and wait, this is this is a microphone. <laughs> okay. It so, looks like something out of the fifties. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, <laughs> uh, I know. Um, uh, yes. Okay. Um, great. So, wait. Do you want to take it away? Yeah. Thanks for those kind words, Professor. Uh, so, let's just. Okay, can people online give me an indication of whether they can see that? Actually, wait, I think it's... Or is it showing the presenter view? I think it's showing the, the presenter view. view. So here, I can help. If we want to reverse the two. Right. Uh, okay, so let's... Let, let me see if I can frob this as needed to uh, make that happen. I'm... I'm uh, um, okay, so so let's uh, ba bum bum bum. Okay, I think we want to do s probably slideshow monitor um, um uh, 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 primary monitor. Let, let's let's try that. At least it's different. Um, there we go. Great. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to you this afternoon about a, a case study with, uh, and I see I've forgotten to update the date, but that's, this is a little, an older model. So uh, this was, this model was done with uh, the community. Oh, we're gonna do that. If, if you want to, I, sure. I think your voice, tends to carry well, but you want to. Struggle. Okay, I'm just gonna get this mic going here. Check, check. So this was done with the community of uh, Yellow Quill First Nation. So uh, I guess I'll introduce the, the, the people working. So we worked with uh, a community research coordinator by the name of Myron Niapatung. He was, this is kind of, especially, you know, if you're not Indigenous, and I am not, uh, when you're working with Indigenous communities, it's 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 important to ensure community involvement in a way that's viewed as positive by the community. And this, uh, Myron, was our sort of interface between us as non-Indigenous scientists and, and the community of Yellow Quill. Uh, the academic supervisors involved were doctors Lalita Bardwaj and Lori Bradford. And these two professors have over many years built up a relationship with Yellow Quill and uh, a huge amount of credit has to go to Myron and, and these two uh, leading professors for the fact that we were even able to do this research. Uh, and and Dr. Nathaniel Osgood, we all know, uh, Dr. Graham Stricker and Dr. Cheryl Waldner, who are also, uh, you know, well known in this group among some of you. Uh, and there were a number of other students. I'm I'm going to focus on the work that I did, and, and I don't mean to exclude them. There, this was a huge project, and there were social scientists and health scientists and all kinds of people but uh the work i did was kind of involved this group of people and and didn't wasn't at crossways with the other ones so i uh so yellow quill first nation this is this shows it in the continental context and then this is a map of north part of north america as as uh, indigenous people see it, and this is this is where the community is. This big red star. Uh, a little bit about Yellow Quill. They're they're a Soto nation, and they signed Treaty Four in 1876. Uh, there are 2,000 registered members with about 800 who live in on reserve, as is as is said in the in the community itself. Uh, so it's near uh, 
Kellington and Rose Valley, which are other other communities. Uh, it's it, it's part of what is called the Lake Winnipeg Osis watershed, and uh, it has a contentious relationship with the Nut Lake Watershed Association, which is an agricultural organization in the same geographic area. Uh, it's and a lot of this may not be of terrible interest as to, to everyone here, but it's it's in a land form called the prairie pothole till formation. Uh, some historic context uh, about the community's perspective on this. Annual floods have occurred since 2011 and, uh, you know, oral history-wise elders report frequent flooding as far back as the 1970s. Uh, and these damaged roads and culverts seeps into basements uh, and uh, generally causes the kind of problems you'd expect from flooding. Uh, also, uh, they recede slowly. Uh, Nut Lake, which is, in addition to the namesake of that organization, it it's the name of the land for, or the water body that's adjacent to Yellow Quill. Uh, and it, it drains very slowly and it's also its flow regime is being modified for for to retain irrigation work, basically. Uh, and then an anecdote that came out through the community consultation in 2017 there was a van rollover due to due to poor road conditions caused by the flooding and there was a there was a death of a, a mother and two children so this stands out in the community's memory and uh and it's a motivation for for examining these kinds of uh problems so a lot of data were gathered for this project uh there was a lidar survey that's a that was done via an, a fixed wing aircraft that examined the land elevation in a huge area surrounding the community as well as the community itself. This fed into what was called the WDPM, which is Wetland DEM Ponding Model, wherein DEM stands for Digital Elevation Model. This is a huge project by the Department of Hydrology here at the U of S. And uh, I, I'm not going to dig into details about that, but it's a different kind of computer modeling that they do. But the, we use the outputs from their model to inform our agent-based model. There is also some GIS work uh, and that LIDAR data informed that as well. And then community... Community consultation was a big part of this project and community data informed uh, at all points uh, the different models that were constructed. Health data was also used to, to inform the agent-based model, which is the part that I worked on. And then we got some results. And then kind of what we're trying to indicate here is throughout the process, we took Inter intermediate results back to the community and says, does this make sense to you? Does this address the concerns that are important to you as community members and things like that? So it was, we want to emphasize that the community was involved throughout the process. So now for this talk, I'm going to start getting a bit more technical about the agent-based model. So it was what we call a hybrid model, which uh, the professor hasn't discussed yet, but will later in the week. Uh, it used a GIS space, which it mean, means a, a map basically, uh, and agents can exist at geographic locations on that map. Uh, we combined all of the three modeling paradigms that are supported by the AnyLogic software. So agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete event simulation. <clears throat> there were multiple networks set up. So uh, I don't think we've done a network 
yet, but uh, you could have more than one even, and, and we did. Uh, we use something called inheritance, which is a computer science concept. I'll talk a bit more about that later, but I'll, I'll try not to dwell on it. So we had many types of agents. Uh, the, the first one was a person which represented an individual in, in the Yellow Quill community. Uh, there were places, and there were several kinds of them. So homes, workplaces, schools, cultural sites, and a nursing station or clinic. Uh, and these, the commonalities between these is that they all had a geographic location on the map. Uh, there were water sources, which in, the main one is a treatment plant, but there are other sources. And there was a water transporter. And this, if for those who grew up in urban settings, this may seem novel, but this community has part of the community served by what they call a truck to cistern water system. So there's each house has a big cistern or a tank, and every few days a truck comes with treated water and fills up the tank and then and then goes on to to do that for other people and that's how they get their their fresh water uh, and then we we started to work on a sort of generalized health condition to allow for for multiple sort of health idea like health conditions among people in the model. There were there was a pond agent, and I'll discuss what this represents a bit more on a later slide. And then there was a mechanism called the storyteller, which was another kind of key feature of this model, especially given the importance of storytelling in Indigenous culture and the need to have a rapport with the community and, and a back and forth open discussion about whether this was working for them. So we've seen a bit of state charts and uh, I'm gonna show you a few for the different agents. So this was the person and they were, a person was basically healthy or unhealthy at a, at a high level. And then this big ugly one on the right is it represents their movement around the community. So they have, in, in this section is the regular commute. And then if, if they get sick, they may seek care and there's a different pattern there. And then occasionally there are cultural events that draw in almost all of the community members. And that's what this third sort of pain is over here. And then this is, we've seen these constructs for the most part uh, we haven't seen functions yet, but we've seen parameters, we've seen variables, and this is just sort of a screenshot of the person, another area of the person agent. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll now look at the place agent, and I'll try not to bore you with technical computer science mumbo jumbo too much, but every place has certain features, and that's what this graphic is showing. So a place has a latitude and a longitude, where it is on the map. It has it can have people inside it and some, some other parameters as telling you about it. And uh, it, it can be clean or contaminated in terms of uh, being a, a reservoir for a pathogen. Now, this shows you uh, where in the analogic interface you can you can set up what is called inheritance, and then we'll. But if if you're interested in that and it applies to your project, I can spend some time with you later. So this is the nursing station agent, and this all this grayed out stuff is because it's a kind of place. So anything that's true of the place generally is also true of the nursing station because it's a kind of place. So that's basically what inheritance represents is it's like X is a kind of Y type of relationship. And then this is, and we haven't seen this yet in the bootcamp either. This is called, or yes, we have. 
we've seen a discrete event simulation workflow. So people enter, uh, people enter the, the clinic, they may be allocated a bed, they can leave without being seen if they wait too long, and then it takes certain time uh, and human resources to treat them, and then they then they get released and go about their business. So there we go. This is an example of a water source, and it's kind of generalized, so it can represent a, a water treatment plant, or it can represent a, a reservoir of either a cistern that serves a single house. There's also something called a reservoir booster pumping station in the community, which basically has a big tank and, and pumps that, that boost the water out to, to more distant houses. So this was sort of designed such that it can represent any of those types of water infrastructure. Uh, the water transport is, a, is a, another mobile agent. So this is a truck. I mentioned about that a bit. So it, it, it does, the left pane here of its state chart talks about making deliveries of water and it has its own tank on the back of the truck. And when that gets empty, it has to go and refill itself. And then it goes back to delivering water to houses, re rinse and repeat. Yes, Professor. And it, it probably bears emphasis for people here to understand that a lot of these mechanisms that Wade has talked about, the delivery of water, the the the, the pumping station, the, this truck, um, and the cisterns have direct relevance to the illness side. And, yes. and uh, you may come back to that way, but I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that, for example, the water truck could be contaminated. Yes. In which case it would be a, a, a risk because it could spread contamination. For example. Yeah, and, and that's, that's pro it's probably good to bring that up at this point. Like maybe some of you folks are thinking, well, who cares? I'm not a water infrastructure person. Maybe this is not of interest. But yeah, this... If the truck is contaminated and it delivers to a cistern, it contaminates the cistern. And then if people in the house that is served by the cistern drink that water, they can get sick. And so that's that, essentially why we're building up all this background. And that was of concern to the community because people could get sick from this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we... We... Uh, sort of had a generalized health condition that allowed us to represent a, a communicable disease, but also injuries. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much in the interest of time and, and the fact that we're early in the training session. Nastran has built up more on top of this. So uh, I think either I or her could talk about it with you if you're, if you're interested in more details. So the, another big interest of the community was the flooding. And I think in the, in the history slide, we kind of discussed that. So it, this is in a region, as I said earlier, called the Prairie Pothole uh, Landform. And when it rains or when you have snow melt, it makes these ponds all over the place. And we'll see a, a sort of map of that in a moment. But uh, to handle how these ponds interfere with people's movement on the map, we created this pond agent. So every, uh, every pond of pooled water has an agent associated with it. And when person agents are, are moving around, they, these things check and say, oh, there's someone trying to cross this deep water, I'm going to tell them, hey, you're stuck because you are you can't cross this water. Uh, it's in your way. Uh, so that's what this is about. And it's uh, it may be a non-obvious use of an agent, but uh, it, uh, it serves that purpose to identify where people's daily activities are being interfered with by floodwaters, basically. So this is a screenshot of that storyteller and it's probably illegible on the big screen, but the the, the details, uh, basically what this allows you to do is an agent can tell its story by printing key 
events that happen to it into this storyteller that that sort of keeps a record of that uh, throughout the model run. And the way I've set up the model is it randomly selects about 10 or 15 people because there's hundreds of them in the simulation. Uh, and it says, oh, we're going to tell the story of these people and then you can click through it and see what's happening. So like the, the colored text gives us some ideas. So this person was, the black text is like the regular commute. And then they were exposed to some, uh, uh, to a pathogen, but they didn't get sick. And then a couple more times it happened. And then here the red tells us they, they got sick from, they were finally exposed one too many times. They got sick and then they did some mundane things. And then they went to the, nursing station and got a treatment for their sickness. And then they did some other regular daily duties. So that's uh, what that is. I think this was a key sort of, because you can look at graphs and that those are nice for us as scientists to see like what fraction of people had this or that happened to them. But I think it was key for the community to say, okay, let's pick one person and see what happened to them as the model played out. And let's check another person and see what happened to them and how was that different. And that's what this allowed. And this is, again, it's probably kind of hard to see. This is the map in the GIS software, Geographic Information Systems, that stands for, if you don't know. The red area overlay is the, the Yellow Quill First Nation Territory. The, all these blue dots are ponds of water at the high water mark. So you can see, you can kind of get an idea. There's all these ponds all over the place and it's totally covered with them. So that's where it gets its name. And then there's, it's a bit harder to see, but there's a bunch of yellow, uh, sorry, green dots within the community. And these are community locations that have, that have either been related to us by community members as being significant or picked off of air photos of the community and marked in the, in the map. So this was all used as inputs to the model. Uh, this was just a zoom in on the core area of the community. And uh, again, it may be hard to see, but there's a pond right here on this intersection here. That's like downtown Yellow Quill and, and you can't really get around the community without crossing that intersection. And every year it's it's covered in water to the point where you can't get through it. And you got to go like way up and around and south and back to, to get around. It's 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 a significant problem that hasn't been addressed for many years. <clears throat> this is the digital elevation model. And you can see these dots are the community places. Uh, the, the shade of green represents the elevation of the land. And then this is, this is sort of a better view, I guess, of the pawns, right? The, you can see the blue dots with the DEM. So these sort of light colored areas are actually water bodies. So they're wet all the time. So they're kind of excluded from the WDPM model. But all these all these blue ponds are outputs of this WDPM from that were provided to us from the hydrology department. Uh, I used a, a program called QGIS, which I'll plug very briefly. It's free, it's open source, it's multi-platform, Python scriptable. Uh, if you have need of GIS software and can't afford S3 or the other major commercial package, that's something to think about. And we've, we've got a paper out in uh, the journal Water, and that this is it. And I think uh, that's it for my talk. So that was kind of a casual, I guess, tone on my talk, but I'd like to invite you to, yeah, Professor. Yeah, maybe I'll just emphasize one or two things. So um, when it comes to models, and we'll be discussing this some in boot camp, um, I mentioned this morning, the one of the key needs is to think about model scope. What needs to be in the model to capture the events? And you heard here, 
as Wade indicated, you know, a fair bit about water infrastructure. And you heard about the water product and you heard about cisterns and water pump fans. You also heard about this digital elevation model and pumps. But at the end of the day, those really mattered for, for two basic reasons. Number one, they were needed to kind of um, uh, refer to these health issues, which community members brought to the table as key health issues. People are getting sick from their systems. People are getting sick um, or people have health needs like dialysis appointments that they can't get to because of water, water blocking, uh, like ponding in the middle of roads. So they're prevented from getting key uh, health needs addressed, you know, like life and death health needs addressed because of these water blockages. These are not small matters to the community. They're actually really quite large models. People are getting sick at powwows or cultural events, for example, because the, I don't know, the water pumping, the water source might have been contaminated or what have you. The other thing is, and this is really important, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug this, that beyond capturing the basic features of the situation in the world related to us by stakeholders, in this case, community stakeholders, so the key need for a lot of modeling to develop confidence of the stakeholders to, to make sure we're, we're capturing their key, their key understanding. The other thing that this model used, the other reason it represented, because those things might be points of intervention in some cases. So you might be starting to ask, for example, um, you know, what if we had a way of cleaning the water truck so contamination was not... Um, uh, it was not something which, you know, once it started, it could go for many days in a row. Suppose there was some way of decontaminating it. Suppose that cistern water, you know, we had some way of, um, of, of uh, detecting early if cistern water was contaminated. How would that affect things? Could that lower the burden? Um, or, or what if we were to put in place changes to... Uh, the location of certain resources. So would it help a lot fewer people miss their dialysis appointment or something like that? These are what if questions that could be brought to the table. And by representing these things, we can ask what if questions about them, about them as outcomes or about changing them. And, and that ends up often being a big motivation for representing them. So I just wanted to plug the fact that by representing these things, we can ask what if. And I think one of the things, if I'm not mistaken, Wade, that was of interest to your broader term was the fact that over time, there may be a risk that the flooding could grow worse. And you might be able to look at, you know, how would worsen bloody, the flooding affect things with climate change or change of precipitation. I, I don't think that ended up getting looked at. But it was, I think, discussed early on. That was a concern of the community. It wasn't. It didn't get into the agent-based model, but it was a, certainly a focus of the the, the WDPM model uh, by the hydrology department, and could be hypothetically, it wasn't, but it could. They could give us new outputs for a extreme climate event from WDPM, and we could put them in here right. and rerun this model and get. Different and see what results. the implications would be for the community for those climate change effects in a way that might motivate funding to mitigate some of those risks or something like that. Yeah. Okay. But questions on this. This is a unique model that straddles community engaged modeling and some really quantitative data sources, but at the same time, some sort of rough characterizations of some health health issues um, that where there wasn't good data available. So questions for Wade, though, about this project. I guess I'm interested in the storytelling. Model. Yeah. And when, I mean, you're comparing, so tell me if I'm wrong. I think what I'm understanding is that it, there's a different scenario that's being played out for each of the dots, for example, if we... Yes. Right? And so... You, when you're presenting that to the community and they're looking at what were some examples of comments they might have made or differences they're seeing, or can you give me a little more on how that works? I 
I can't, unfortunately, because I things conspired and I wasn't there for the final meeting with the committee. And I'm disappointed that that's the way it worked out, but it was, that's just the way it did, I guess. But I, I, I was assured by the team members who were present for that con uh, that consultation that it was sort of a key sort of part of the dialogue. But is any of that in this paper? This paper focuses on the agent-based model. Uh, if there were there have been other papers by other well, some of the co-authors are common, like like Dr. Bradford and and Bardwaj, but. There, there, there were other papers by other members of the team, basically that that discussed other, and I can probably dig those up if you're if you're interested. I'll see Laura. No. Yeah, you know her, so certainly, yeah, I'm sure she could. I'm sure she could point you, and maybe some of them are still, you know, in her group, and and you can talk directly with them. And, and I think was Cheryl at um, the meeting with. Uh, where the storyteller? No. Okay. Uh, but Cheryl Waldner is one of the co-authors and was part of this team, but she, she was not present at that meeting either. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry about that. Yeah, I maybe I'll I'll just comment on that. The the point is, um, I think uh, a really deep one, and you know, the the longer I spend it in health and the more I interact with uh, those in health systems, I, I realize the power of effective storytelling. Um, storytelling is um, uh, one of the most effective ways to communicate messages. It's something that can really stick with people, a good story, in a way that purely quantitative data doesn't. And and models can be really effective storytelling vehicles at a collective level and at an individual level. And this was something we found actually in a, another hackathon we ran with, uh, with uh, that was focused around community engaged interventions related to the opioid epidemic and particularly an intervention, the Addictions Recovery Community Health Program, um, where we had uh, a community member with lived experience of homelessness and, and drug use uh, who came to the event. Um, and also related to the stories at an individual level being told by the model. Um, and in this case, we invested in the storytelling module, which sought to kind of take the experience of a person in the model and kind of diarize it so we had some sort of record we could show to someone. Otherwise, it's just kind of an informal looking at what's going on at an individual level and saying, oh yeah, you know, that rings true to me. Um, whereas here, you can actually play out a, a storyline for a person. But more than that, they, models, models express collective stories. They, affect, uh, uh, they, they express stories at a higher level these emergent behavior, the, the overall outcomes of the model. And, and uh, often it's um, a key part of being a modeler for scenarios to notice what those stories are and figure out what are they saying? What are they telling us? And being able to boil that down into, you know, a, a, a short, crisp description is really valuable. So models, um, storytelling, uh, is something that has grown up as a craft around modeling. Um, and this was one of the early um, attempts to translate that at, at an individual level. It is something that Jenna has also sought to tap in some of her modeling with homelessness and and um, in COVID-19. Um, and it's something uh, which I think could be an important component for a lot of models particularly those who deal with community members, people with lived experience, um, other stakeholders who may be um, operating at the level of a particular clinician or of a person in the community. So I think it's one of these areas where models can expand a lot and where there's so much potential to tap. 
Yeah, I think if I could briefly add to that, I think depending on your personal like lived experience as a as a researcher, you may be able to relate to different like some people work with aggregate data all the time and it's and it speaks to them. I've been told by you know clinicians that they some some of them prefer the agent based view of simulation modeling because they can say this is a patient and this is how I I as a clinician would deal with this patient and this is they can relate to it better than oh you know 67% of people uh you know had this condition after the intervention and so I think but I think it's important to communicate in both of those ways uh to to bring everyone in yeah, and I think that's a fair thing to say. I mean, one advantage that agent-based models have is that they, they do, by nature, have some, almost by definition, some features at an individual level. So you can capture histories of people, their experience over time, um, what's going on at an individual level, but they also allow you to aggregate up to the overall level. Um, there's other classes of models, and in and, and system dynamics, it's particularly common, where um, you, you're really dealing with the aggregate as your um, as your level. There's there's not the option of going down to the individual level, and those tell powerful stories too. But they're limited in their resolution of being able to represent certain things. And as Wade said, um, you know, uh, for some those higher levels, it's just too abstract for them to develop confidence about it. It's really these individual level depictions that they can relate to and cross check with their experience. Yeah. So I think it's it's one of these things that comes in, you know, when we're dealing with modeling, what speaks to the stakeholders, community members, um, people with lived experience that we're dealing with, how can we communicate with them, develop confidence by them, elicit their insights more effectively? And sometimes you have to be aware of their limitations. I will say that I've been told that demographers, I've been told by a demographer that they really like aggregate representations because they're very used to dealing with demographic categories and kind of different groups, and they find aggregate representations very natural. They don't find them lacking in any way. So, so knowing your audience is, is valuable. Yeah. Other questions or, or things people would like to engage with? About? I don't know, like there's no question, but I want to say like, I worked in so many communities and collected data or qualitative, quantitative, every sort of data and, you know, showing this kind of like uh, model in community based, like I'm so excited and I want to say thank you to you. Like, uh, because in the community study, we can put these, you know, it modeling and it is new to me. So thank you for sharing this knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I, I'll say system dynamics modeling, another prominent, rich um, tradition, feedback and accumulation centric and one close to my heart. One which Wade tapped here, and it was a tripartite model at a some, it was agent-based as the overall framework, but some system dynamics, particularly with water contamination, um, in some discrete event, like for the clinic flow. Um, in the system dynamics area, there's a lot of attention to participatory engagement, engagement with communities, and, and, and um, uh, there's rich languages um, to do so in a semi-quantitative way with things like causal loop diagrams and and uh, in agent-based modeling, that ability is just being tapped. And our group is one of those that's most um, persistently, aggressively, and, and widely, you know, really promoting this. I think it's a key need with modeling. Um, all too often, certain lines of modeling, micro simulation first among them, um, but, but agent-based modeling um, traditionally often has been a little bit technocratic. It's been a little bit reserved, you know, by experts or, or very technical individuals. 
and not engaging with communities. And there's no inherent reason for that. It's just, it's been mostly a sociological phenomenon. And um, I think coming to communities engaging has enormous uh, possibilities, potential for further enriching the models, helping them uh, achieve more, helping achieve community buy-in, insight, um, you know, uh, sense of ownership, um, um, securing feedback about really what's going on in the ground in ways that are absolutely essential for model success. So I'm a big believer in it, and I appreciate your comments um, about uh, its importance. So thank you. Good. Any other questions for Wade? Okay. If we're not hearing that, let's thank him very much. Uh, thanks greatly, Wade. Uh, thank you for being willing to share that. Okay. Um. Uh, so we're about to close out uh, for the day, and uh, uh, we're a little bit behind, but uh, I think we've done very well today.